Okay, our final speaker uh, is David Lawrence. David has a rich history and background in the del delivery of health care. He served for 10 years as the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Board of uh, Kaiser Foundation Health Plan and the Kaiser Foundation Hospital. He currently advises a number of companies, including, does anybody advise you? Larry at Somalogic? I see, got it. And um, he has agreed to wrap up these two days to try to synthesize how all of this information can lead to a new consumer-focused healthcare ecosystem. David? Very much. This is a daunting task uh, to try and close in uh, two days that have been this interesting and this stimulating. Uh, what I'd like to do is not what Larry suggested I would do, which is to debunk physicians, because I don't, I believe, very deeply in the profession in which I was trained and the work in, that we do. But I do want to start with a proviso, and that is that I was very influenced by a book that Paul Starr wrote. It came out in the 1980s, which looked at the history of the medical profession in the United States, which is called The Social Transformation of American Medicine, colon, The Rise of a Sovereign Profession. And what I want to do today is to build on that idea by suggesting that many of the assumptions we make about the medical care profession and its role in healthcare are relatively recent. They really have a history of maybe 70 or 80 years in their current form. And many of the ideas that grew out of that, many of the regulations built around it, many of the means for rewarding physicians that grew out of that effort to establish sovereignty are now obsolete. What we're seeing, and I want to talk about this afternoon, with all that you've heard today, is a remaking of the landscape of healthcare and a remaking of the role of the physician in healthcare. It is extraordinarily uncomfortable. Because after all, we are sovereign. We're at the top of the heap, we make the most money, we run the show, we set the standard, we set the agenda for healthcare. Patients come to us. What I want to talk about is a different model. And I think that's the gist of what we've heard today. Second thing, before I start, you know, we talk about what we do as physicians as being extraordinarily important for population health. But if one looks at the data on determinants of health in a population, contributes, uh, contributors to reducing mortality, for example, healthcare explains about 10% of potential reduction or reduction that occurs. We talked about lifestyle being important, it is. Genetics are being important, it is. The environment is extraordinarily important. But healthcare, medical care, sick care that we do, explains only a small part of the potential to reduce overall mortality or improve the population's health. Some excellent references on this. As we get deeper and more skilled at what we do, perhaps we can inch that percentage up, but don't suffer under the illusion that what we do in medicine has a material impact on the overall health status of the population, except to suck resources, as Dick Lam talked about, away from other things that could improve health. So that's what I'd like to talk about this morning, this afternoon. What I'm going to talk about is the emerging consumer health ecosystem. It builds on some of the things you heard from Don Jones yesterday, some of the technologies that we've talked about during the last two days, some of the ideas that we just heard about from David. Uh, so let's look at this. What I'm going to do is talk about four things. I want to talk about the context that's creating the opportunity for the kinds of disruptions that I'm going to describe. I want to talk about the early steps in those disruptions, what's happening. And thirdly, talk about where the potential and potentially powerful impact of molecular science is in helping accelerate that disruption. First, the context. I want to talk about demographic imperatives and the impact of that or those imperatives on demand, talk about the supply, the capacity of the current system, the sick care system to respond, how well it's doing, and what the major issues are facing us. This is a slightly different view than what Dick Lamb was talking about. 
In a recent report just published by the Metropolitan Project at the, at the Brookings Institute, this was a comment that was made at the opening of the report. Five new demographic realities are redefining who we are, where and with whom we live, and how we provide for our own welfare as well as that of our families and communities. And those specifically are a major trend of growth in the population. You've read probably the book, The Next 100 Million by 2050 will add 100 million people to the population, roughly. Stop and think about that. Second thing is the incredible diversity of the population. This is lost in much of our conversation. By 2050, the United States will be almost a majority minority country. There are 185 languages and dialects spoken in the LA basin today. One of four children born in the United States today is born to a parent who was born outside the United States. Stop immigration today, as Colorado's illustrious former senator would suggest we should do, and these trends would still proceed forward. The third thing that's happening that's fascinating is aging. You heard that from Dick Lamb. But the fourth and fifth are really disturbing for health care. Uneven higher educational attainment. Higher education is largely accessible to those who are in the upper middle and upper classes. The proportion of people in the minority communities who are going to college, the proportion of people coming out of poor backgrounds going to college is diminishing. And the gap in education between those haves and have-nots is widening. Same with income. What that means, let's see if I can, I'm almost afraid to touch this. I was watching it flip back and forth before, and I'm afraid to touch it. I'm afraid where my slides are going to end up. But these are the things that result. First of all, there is going to be, and is already, an enormous increase in demand for health care over the next 30 to 40 years, and an enormous increase in the complexity of that demand that is driven not only by scientific discovery and what we can do, but also by the fact that we have to figure out how to meet the cultural expectations of 185 different language and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, language speaking groups or subgroups in the, in the population. Actually, the number of languages spoken in the United States and dialects is well over 300. It's just 185 of them are represented in the, the LA Basin. By the way, another interesting fact about that, there are 125 language-specific newspapers for those communities. Amazing. Now, we'll go to the next. Oh, I'm sorry. The second thing is that there'll be a substantial increase in health illiteracy. Remember uh, what Scott was talking about, I believe, when you were describing some of the work that you were doing about the levels of education that you, that you have to prepare your health care information for and solve problems for, this will get worse. We have a significant problem and disparity in the United States already in health literacy, and that's likely to get more pronounced. Same is true with economic and cultural barriers to care. And finally, we have a well-documented, probably 10 IOM studies on health disparities between different or among different uh, groups in, in our communities in, across the United States. This too is projected to get much more pronounced. So this is the context. Now how's the healthcare system, the supply side, doing and responding? Well today we kill 80,000 people with preventable medical errors, roughly. That's just in the hospitals. That was a figure published in 1999, based on studies done in the early 90s. And I've worked with the Lucian Leap Institute for the last several years, and we spend a lot of time scratching our heads about whether this has gotten better or worse. And by all indications, we can find is that although there's been a lot of Brownian motion in the hospitals to try and improve quality and safety, the fact is that safety's gotten worse for two reasons. One, the technology has gotten more powerful and deadly if used incorrectly. And secondly, there are a shortage of nurses. 
So we're using a large number of nurses who come from other countries, not a bad thing, except for the, ling the language problems, the health literacy problems, the ability to understand orders and carry them out properly. So we think we've actually increased the risk. Secondly, healthcare, according to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, operates at a level of performance of one sigma. Now that means we make an error every 10 times we do something. Not very good. You heard David talk yesterday at Medco of operating at a five to six sigma level in their pharmacy refill area. That's about the standard for most high technology areas. Healthcare operates at one error for every six times they do something, or every 10 times they do something. There's well over a 200%. I, I, I actually fudged it a little bit because if you look at the Dartmouth Atlas data, there are various diseases for which there's a three to 400% variation from one community to the next in the way in which physicians practice. And there is not a shred of evidence that suggests that there is a substantial difference in the risk profiles of the communities that would argue for these differences. It appears to be a function of when physicians were trained, where they were trained, where they went, and, and what communities they practice in that explain the practice patterns in those communities, not science. Scary. It's ironic, as an aside, that we're worried about cookbook medicine as physicians when, in fact, we all operate with cookbooks. It just happens to be the one that we were trained with. Don't ever let anybody, when you hear that argument and you're trying to make that argument about, or make the, the case for, not, or for using uh, algorithms, using standards, that sort of thing, don't let the argument of that's cookbook medicine deter you. Just remind them they're using cookbooks, they're using their own cookbooks, and the chances are better than 50-50 that they're outdated. Third, or fourth, excuse me, we already, I, met, I already mentioned the significant health disparities by class and ethnicity that suggest that the, the medical care system is doing a poor job of providing access in medical care to different ethnic groups, different cultural groups, different socioeconomic groups in our society. And finally, we have a crumbling primary care system. I'm going to say more about that in a minute. The result is we have extremely poor or, uh, health status for our population. Now, take away the issues of, of a multicultural society that we have, perhaps more pronounced than most, and the disparities don't go away. But they do seem to be focused primarily on the fact that we tend to have the widest dispersion between the poor and the wealthy of most of the developed economies. Our ability to transfer wealth, our willingness to transfer wealth, is among the most limited of the developing economies, and socioeconomic status drives many of these disparities. Secondly, we have the highest per, uh, per capita healthcare costs in the world, and it's almost double the next highest. The next highest actually is Switzerland, which is about 11 to 12 percent of the GDP. We're 17 on our way to 20. And there is somewhere in our, or in our healthcare system, Many of us estimate, and you heard a little bit of this yesterday from David at Medco, that we're wasting roughly 50 cents on the dollar. And it's not waste because we're providing too much care or too little care or the wrong care, although that's a contributor. It's because it's organized so badly. And it's used so incorrectly. In addition to these things, talking about how the supply side is responding to this, this demographic, this large demographic assault that we're, we're undergoing, is the dwindling number of physicians going into primary care. The estimates at the present time is that there's a shortage of about 40,000 primary care physicians. Secondly, that there is an overrepresentation, very serious overrepresentation of a Caucasian and Asians among medical students and medical school graduates, and a, a marked underrepresentation of African Americans and Latinos. The same is true with nursing and the problem with the nursing workforce, very pronounced and a relatively new phenomenon, probably a decade to two decades old, 
is the fact that the nursing profession is aging rapidly. The other is that there's only been a slight increase in the number of medical school training slots since 1985. Big bump, or a little bit of a bump up just the last four or five years in the face of what's per perceived to be this primary care shortage. But in general, the level of training, the numbers of physicians being trained, is roughly what it was in 1985. It's up a little bit, but don't, it's nothing to get excited about. So what this means is that we aren't and cannot meet the demands that are coming with the traditional physician-based delivery model. Can't be done. We can't train enough. We can't employ them. We're already paying through the nose for the care that we're providing. And moreover, we've tried for 30 years or more to change the demographic profile of physicians coming into training and have only been able to move the needle slightly. And part of the reason, of course, is because the primary and secondary education programs that lay the groundwork for people being able to go into the sciences and pre-medical sciences and on into medicine are markedly varied across the country. So we're not going to solve this problem by simply, simply lay, uh, saying, admit more people who are uh, Latinos and African Americans. We've, seen, we've tried that for at least 25 or 30 years. It ain't working. Second thing that's really important I think David just talked about it today, or in a, a few minutes ago, in, in relation to Mayo, is that our efforts to change ourselves, the existing sick care system, have been dismally slow. And part of the reason is we have it really good. In spite of all the regulation, in spite of all the, the, the calls about bad care, in spite of all the efforts to try and put more transparency into health care, it's not a bad life especially for docs, we're on top. We have been very resistant to change in healthcare and in these sick care systems. Yes, there's changes at the margin, incremental changes around the edges, but truly disruptive changes, true innovations in the way we do things are few and far between. Moreover, 65% of physicians remain in solo or small single group practices. It was 80%. We're getting somewhere because more women are entering medicine and more women are choosing group practices because of some of the lifestyle issues that were mentioned earlier. So we've made some headway there, but it isn't changing very fast. The other thing which is really quite important, if you read Paul Starr's book, one of the principles that was embedded in the emergence of our profession was this notion of individual professional autonomy. I do what I think is correct for my patient. That worked really well when what I did was more or less the same thing as what the next doc did. But today, imagine the fact, as you heard yesterday, that the average Medicare patient has three chronic illnesses at 65, and by the time they get to be my age, at late, late 60s, going into my 70s, I'm supposed to have five or six of them, statistically. The average number of physicians that I will have at 65 is somewhere between three and six, and by the time I get to the point that I have a complex set of chronic illnesses or a single comp complex illness, or am at the last year of my life, I will have between 10 and 15 physicians on average. Each one of whom is doing what I think is right for my patient. Pretty stupid. So we got addition, or adding to the chronic disease burden. Chronic disease brings complexity. Complexity requires multiple points of view to provide the proper care, and yet we are training physicians in the paradigm of individual autonomy. By the way, that's the ethical framework within which we're trained. It turns out that what was ethical in the 20th century is probably unethical in the 21st. Collaborative medicine, team-based medicine, 
is in fact the way you minimize the opportunities for error, increase the wisdom of a collective decision-making process, and it can be done as the Mayo Clinic has demonstrated. It's well illustrated in Clay Christensen's book. It actually happened to one of the authors, Jerry Grossman, before he died. That a collective meeting, what Christensen and the, and the others call a solution shop meeting, where you bring together the best minds at Mayo who have seen the patient and talk with the patient and the family about what they have found and what the best plan is means that you don't get the kind of overload. You move away from these maximally invasive kinds of plans. This would be a good summary today. It was written in 2001. It was in the preamble to the Crossing the Quality Chasm study by the Institute of Medicine. It said basically between the care that we, that we have and the care we could have lies not a gulf, but a chasm. So that's the situation for the emerging consumer health ecosystem. I mean, we can talk all we want about how, how marvelous it will be to improve the ability that I have to communicate with my patients, and believe me, I believe in that. But it isn't going to make a huge difference in the care that people get or in their outcomes because there's some deep flaws in the way in which we've conceptualized our roles as doctors. And there's some deep limits on how far we can push the 20th century model of care delivery. What is this consumer health ecosystem? Well, let me, I'll read it to you. You're looking at it yourself. Solutions that are delivered directly to the individual, family, and the community that include wellness, prevention, disease management, triage, and navigation, and are independent of the sick care system, including doctors. Keyword, independent sick care system. This is not the sick care system. This is not sticking a pseudopod out of the sick care system or that sick care ecosystem and saying we're going to make it better by redrawing the, law, the, the, the role of the primary care physician and creating something called a medical home. That's essentially as that well-known vice president <coughs> candidate once said, or somebody said about her, I can't remember what it was, but it's putting lipstick on a pig. Um, <laughs> and in a certain sense, and I don't, I mean, I, I have great hopes that the medical home model with primary care will have an impact at the margin, but the numbers don't support it, that it's going to be the solution. <laughs> must be a family physician. I, <laughs> <laughs> it's coming, okay, it's booting up again. While it's booting, I'm going to go on to the next one, so you, you don't even know what this next one is. So as it says there, um, let me just make a few comments, they'll come up. The consumer health ecosystem presents those solutions that I just described. And the important thing is that they are technology-based. They build on the communication systems, in particular wireless, but also the internet. They build on our capacity with microprocessing to build in-body, on-body, around-body sensing of the sort that Don Jones was talking about. And they build on the computing capabilities and the sort of the algorith algorithm building capabilities in advanced computing for smart decision making. Those are some of the technologies that we're building on to create this consumer health ecosystem. It also, and this is critically important, remember the medical model that we grew up in in the 20th century was really predicated in part on the Flexnerian model you just heard David describe and on the creation of laws and hegemony to support us as individual physician professionals. 
The investment in medical science took off after World War II. And we estimate that since World War II, we've, we've invested somewhere close to $2 trillion in public and private funds in medical, and techno medical technology discovery. So it builds on this science, this collective experience. And the good news about this, the thing that is so optimistic, for, or makes me so optimistic about it, is that as you think about these, and I'm going to give you some examples in a few minutes, what makes them very attractive is that they provide a technology-like cost structure and technology-like reliability. Instead of one sigma, we can begin to deliver some solutions at a much higher level of reliability. And here's what we think we can reach. We can deliver those services, wellness prevention, disease management, triage, navigation, those five areas, and I'll talk a little more about them with some examples. We believe we can deliver them at half the cost of what the sick care system does. And we, can, we believe we can deliver them with five to six sigma levels of reliability. I think that meets what Clay Christensen's definition of disruption is. We also believe that we can scale these at levels that no one in healthcare with their sick care systems has been able to do. Remember, at Kaiser Permanente, we are the largest when I was there, I'm no longer associated with it, but when I was there, and it still is, the largest private health care system in the world. Covered 12 states. Took care of 8 million people. The next largest private system in the world is Mayo, which is one quarter the size. That's the, the amount of scale that we've been able to achieve with the sick care system delivery system been really hard. Ask anybody from Mayo, ask David, ask anybody from Mayo how hard it is to try and create an integrated, coherent organization across the three sites in which they operate, the major sites. And I can tell you from personal experience at Kaiser, it was what we did all, our t all the time, was trying to build coherence across these multiple sites. Managing scale in sick care delivery with all of the judgments and all the independence that comes with the professionals inside there is extraordinarily difficult. We haven't cracked that code. What's interesting about these consumer-based solutions is that the, one of the key attributes of a technology approach, technology-based approach, especially using wireless, some of the ubiquitous technologies like that, is the ability to scale, and scale at costs that are much lower than what we do in the sick care system. What it represents, and this is really critical, is a new front end for healthcare. It is an emerging primary health care or health system that replaces many of what many of the things and does them better than what we have used as our primary care model in the 20th century. It's also one of four legs in what we would call a balanced healthcare system that is made up of public health, or social health, if you will, directed to communities, primary health, sick care, and end-of-life care. Now, each of those is a different problem. Trying to solve it with a single operational or organizational model, the doctor-hospital diathesis, makes no sense. Let's look at what this looks like today. In terms of resource consumption, about 97% of all the resources spent on health care in the United States go to feed the sick care system. The green blip on, the le on your left is the primary health care capability today. It is almost, not quite, rudimentary. 23% to 30% of physicians call themselves primary care physicians. The expenditures into primary care are much lower than that because, of course, 
the requirements of the sick care system are extraordinarily expensive. The blue is end of life. And the red, completely unconnected to the rest of the care system, is public health. Where, as I mentioned, 50 to 60 percent of the opportunities to reduce morbidity and mortality lie. So when we talk about creating a balanced, whoops, a balanced care system, this is really what we're trying to do. Something that, in terms of resource use, in terms of relative importance, looks more like this. And what I'm talking about right here is this P. That's not P prime. That's called Dave with a serious tremor when he hit the P, I think, and or tried to, <laughs> tried to make this work. <laughs> This is what I'm talking about with this consumer health ecosystem. It sits right in here. What we think, based on what we already have, and the experiments that are now underway with companies that are getting started with efforts to try and test solutions uh, in the market, is that we believe we can deliver comprehensive primary health care services at a far lower cost than the, than the physician-based sick care model can. We believe we can offload a substantial amount of demand onto the sick care system by treating it more appropriately here. Capturing many of these things before they require the services of that sick care system. And we know we can do that with early intervention through, through detection, with appropriate vaccinations. We heard that earlier today. We know we can do it with good triage, with good navigation, by helping people make the right decision about whether or not they need to go into the sick care system or they can deal with this problem through other tool, using other tools. We know we can do it by using disease management appropriately and finding the gaps in care in the way that David talked about that Medco is doing. We believe we can reduce the demand on the sick care system by up to 50%. And we also believe that we can deliver about 90% of what the primary care physician does or has done historically in the old sick care model. We can replace about 90%, not all, And in the process, improve individual health outcomes and quite possibly see some improvement in population health status. Now, what status, what stage are we in with this? Well, we're in the early stages of inventing these solutions. I would describe it as kind of the marketplace or the business place or the business model or the delivery system model experimentation phase. We've been at it about five to seven years. What's interesting is, although there's more science to come, and I'll talk about that in a minute, science, technology, and capital are not the constraints. It's a business model issue. It's a scalability question. How, how can you scale it? How do you scale it? Not whether or not. It's reaching the consumers directly in ways that are attractive and acceptable to consumers and learning how to do that. Now, who's interested in this? Well, first of all, are the strategic buyers. You've heard them talked about. Walmart, Walgreens, Philips, Microsoft, Google, Siemens, ATT, Verizon, Qualcomm, etc. Bundlers, private equity players sitting on $400 billion of money that they are looking to deploy, not necessarily in healthcare, but they're certainly looking at healthcare quite actively to try and figure out how to do roll ups. Employers are very interested in this because they're tired of paying for sick care that doesn't necessarily deliver the value. <coughs> Consumers are looking for it because they can't get access to care. That's why the minute clinics are thriving. That's why the fastest growing area of expenditure in healthcare is for alternative medicine, growing at a far higher rate per annum than the expenditures for healthcare. 
much smaller base, of course, and non-U.S. healthcare systems, who are looking at a much more severe problem with aging than we are. The Chinese Minister of Health said at a meeting three years ago, four years ago, our goal in China is to not repeat the foolishness that you did in the West with your sick care system, but we hope to leapfrog you by using appropriate technology to bring health care closer to people and still provide what is necessary when people do, in fact, become sick enough to need those specialized services. Who's not interested? Most health care systems. Mayo is an exception, by the way, so is Kaiser Permanente, Group Health Cooperative, VA, a few others like that. But for the most part, healthcare systems are scared to death of this. Of course, me and my colleagues, hospitals and hospital systems are more frightened than not, although we're seeing more hospital systems beginning to look at what these options might be. They're recognizing that if they do not have an effective primary care capability in their communities, they lose the source of referrals into their hospitals. And they also, some, fail to meet their not-for-profit requirements to meet the needs of a community. Payers. CMS, the private health insurers, could give a rip. You have to understand that the decisions about the, who, they, who they cover and who they don't, what systems they provide, what are uh, reimbursed, what systems they don't, are partially based on ROI, which would be a no-brainer in this case, but also highly political. They can't afford to alienate their major constituents, who are the hospitals and the doctors. Not the consumers, by the way. And, thank God, U.S. public policymakers. My greatest fear in the health reform discussions this last year was that the Congress and the administration was actually going to try and put some boundaries around this disruptive innovation process prematurely. And in so doing, freeze the system rather than allow for it to continue to develop. Thank God they didn't. Now, where does molecular science and all that we've heard about the last couple days come in? This is crucial. If one goes back to Christensen's book or looks at the work that's been done by Richard Bomer, my colleague at the Harvard Business School, a family physician, in his book called Designing Healthcare, what you understand is that every time you increase probabilistic certainty or understanding of a disease process or a therapeutic intervention, you increase the likelihood that you can shift that responsibility to someone else or some other solution set than a doctor. As happens in every other industry but healthcare. That is not going to happen to the point that there is no role for doctors. Quite the contrary, is because as you know, in the, in, the, uh, in the rare diseases, as we get much more complex with the kinds of pathways we have available, the level of knowledge that's going to be required to do the very high end of care continues to deepen. But what's also been going on, and again, this is the product of the investments in science and technology since World War II, is that we know more about medicine. Is it absolutely certain? Of course not. But molecular science brings greater predictive stability or certainty to many situations. And if you compare the predictive certainty that some of the tests, some of the capabilities in molecular science have brought, and compare it to the other options that we use in the judgment-based kind of model of caregiving that all of us grew up in healthcare, molecular science brings far more certainty. You know, every doctor, as an N of one, imagines that they're 100% sensitive, that our sensitivity is 100%, and that our uh, uh, specificity is 100%. We never miss a false positive and never make a false negative. Molecular science does a little better than that, actually. When you have greater predictive certainty, it becomes possible to set standards. And with standards, you can begin to stabilize the production processes, the care delivery processes, 
and move from the one sigma idiosyncratic model of care delivery that we have today to ones that are far more stable. The place that's done this very interestingly, even in the current model, without all of the advances in molecular science necessarily, is Virginia Mason Health System in Seattle, which has used Toyota lean production techniques. And having sent 750 to 1,000 of its top managers to the Toyota Lean Production College in Japan, has started to re-engineer 58 basic processes inside of Virginia Mason. And every time they do so, it's been going on for 10 years, every time they do so, they improve the reliability of their process, moving towards Six Sigma, and they take about 30 to 40 percent of the costs out of the process. It's also, as you improve reliability and standardization and use the technology platforms appropriately, it's on that basis that you can start to increase scalability. And what also happens with this additional impact of molecular science is that the areas in which you need the physician-based judgments that come from someone trained for seven to nine to a 10 years from medical school through residency and fellowship, the so-called solution shops, decreases. It becomes very critical. You'll never get rid of them. And these are the reasons. If you look at the predictive certainty of what we have in our toolbox today, it's a lot better than when I went into medical school in 1962. But what is bringing, what, it, what molecular science is bringing and promises, it's not perfection, it's not the recreation of the world, it's not the next coming of whoever you believe in, but it is greater predictive certainty. And that's what enables us, I think, or will enable us to build on the platform for, consumer health, uh, for the consumer health ecosystem, broaden it, and even stabilize it and scale it further. So what lies ahead? We're still a young, this is still a young area. But importantly, the major players are circling the space, looking for opportunities, and have the capital, they have the technology know-how, and they know how to scale. And by the way, they don't wait for double-blind studies. We've applied a rather stupid standard to deciding how we're going to organize and deliver care. I understand the need for those kinds of carefully controlled scientific studies and those carefully controlled double-blind studies and clinical trials, et cetera, but that has to do with what we're going to give a patient. But when we talk about how we organize care, there's a very different model, and it's one in which there is rapid learning based on a wise starting point, and then rapidly learning and improving over time because you have a baseline, you have a standard. That's a very different model. These guys know how to scale and they know how to learn. And the other thing that we have looking forward is the consumers are already seeking other solutions and we know, we simply know, there's simply no way you can get the numbers to work that the demand that we anticipate can be met by the current sick care system. It just can't be. And you can't solve it for very much longer using the safety net emergency rooms. Too expensive. Care is too inappropriate, oftentimes, for what these patients need. Now, let me give you some examples. You heard about Somalogic. Larry has talked about it. Scott talked, talked about it yesterday. We, we've, we've heard a lot about the prevention of the well, wellness chip. That's an example of the prevention opportunity. There are many more for a series of consumer triage decisions using many of these same tools and principles. Patients like me, you've heard about, I wanted to just underscore a roll-up, which is Univita. It's a private equity company funded by GenStar Capital, and they bought about five or six smaller companies, rolled them into Univita, and what it's focused on is helping seniors stay at home and independent as they get sicker and sicker. So let me summarize. There's a fundamental sh demographic shift which is driving increased demand and demand complexity of a sort that is unprecedented in the country. 
The sick care system, and I use that term, it, it, many of us have started to use that because it's a, it's a system that's built around trying to deal with illness, with sickness. It cannot now meet, it isn't meeting now, and it certainly isn't going to be able to meet the demand going forward. Just the numbers just don't add up. This combined with science and technology advances is enabling the creation of a disruptive consumer health ecosystem. With the potential to be the new front end for healthcare that can radically change the costs and value received in healthcare, molecular science and scientific advances uh, will improve this opportunity, increase this opportunity by providing greater diagnostic and therapeutic predictability and precision. It is not perfect. I don't want to pretend that it is. And it's a slow process. But everything you see happening in molecular therapeutics and molecular diagnostics, the whole principle of it is built around predictive, uh, predictive probabilities, to, uh, you know, very high-level analytics. The predictive the predictive powers of those are far greater than most of the predictive capabilities of the current laboratory work that we're doing and many of the judgments that we do. There are many reasons for that. We've talked about many of them the last few days. So this increases the likelihood that the outcome will be a more balanced healthcare system. We are getting, we're moving in this direction reducing or putting in place some of the capabilities in primary care and this primary care system that reduce the demand going in this direction. We're also talking about marrying some, of aspect, some aspects of public health with this cons into this consumer health ecosystem, especially in this area of wellness and prevention, vaccine delivery, etc. That too reduces the demand for sick care. Accenture published an interesting, or didn't publish it, but they have built a, a very interesting study that I happened to see when a company came through uh, the venture capital group that I sometimes advise. And essentially they said that if you can help people navigate through the sick care system, and it has to do in part with what we heard yesterday about gaps in care, but also in deciding whether or not I need to go to the sick care system or have something else that is available to take care of my problem, they believe the reductions in costs will be around 50% of what we currently spend in the sick care system. And of course, we did hear from David yesterday, we've heard it again, that the failure to provide an appropriate bridge, part of which molecular diagnostics can help us with, but part of it is the failure of having an appropriate bridge system in place to help early on families and individuals and caregivers address the possibility that the best outcome or the best expected outcome may be a dignified death. Highly touchy. But in fact, what we have now, I, mean, I went through it with my mom five years ago. Fascinating problem. She had terminal cancer. She'd been treated for several years, very sentient, very with it. She said, I'm tired. She was 91. I'm tired. It's my time. Called her family physician. The family physician said, look, I know Bunny. That was my, my mom's name. I know Bunny. I don't think she means it, so I'm not going to sign the order for hospice. So, Are you kidding me? You know? <laughs> She's been, she's been dealing with this for five to seven years. And by the way, we know her reasonably well. We've been taking care of her the last year. And by the way, she's fully sentient. She said she's ready to go. She doesn't mean it. So I delivered a couple of expl expletives <laughs> to this family doc and went to the oncologist who said, of course. It was the, the oncologist who signed the, the order to move her into hospice. That's the kind of bridging system that we need to work on. It's not about death panels. It's not about that crap. But it is about dealing honestly with the fact that there is a limit on how far we can go here and here to extend death or avoid premature death. There's a limit. 
And it's not a limit of money necessarily, as Dick was describing, although that's part of it, but it's also a limit of our science, what we have to offer. So I think we're headed in this direction. And the most important part, next step right now, is building, continuing to build out this consumer health ecosystem. Thank you very much. Be glad to answer any questions you have. I know we're getting, I'm all that's standing between you and a good drink. So, I'm glad that doesn't matter to you, Ed. That's good. <laughs> it never will, David. Thank you, though. Um, uh, some of the organizations that you praised during your talk were nonprofits. And do you have any opinion in the transformation from our present system to the system that you're advocating? What role nonprofit and for profit organizations should have? Yes. <laughs> I have never been and remain uh, absolutely opposed to for profit health care insurance. And uh, I just I see that it adds that the distinction between being a for profit and a not for profit adds no value. To what to health care? Uh, I have a lot of questions about whether the current underwriting based health insurance system is adding any value whatsoever to overall population health when the, the, the primary motivation is to slice and dice the risk pool and avoid those with the worst risk. Um, as I think you pointed out two or three times during the course of the conference, other countries made the decision, and we've, we've made a different one in, in, in the 80s actually it happened, to have a mixed model of for-profit and not-for-profit insurance. Um, we made a decision to move away from community rating. We moved, made a decision to put, until just recently, virtually no constraints on the underwriting requirements on insurers. Uh, I've been in favor of moving us back to community rating, to putting significant constraints on the issues of pre-existing you know, pre conditions, on, on uh, transport, uh, pr transportability of insurance benefits, and the public purpose, the, the community purpose of these not-for-profit entities. Uh, so that, that's number one. Number two, I think there are certain kinds of things that get done in this consumer health ecosystem that have to be done in the commons. And it may be uh, that it, it, it gets to some of the things you've been talking about, actually, with the, with the, with the IT system, the data sources, and so on. Because this, this is really what we all have to rely on to, dis to, to, to discuss risk, to discuss interventions, to look for opportunities for cost savings, and so on. Right now, it's so completely confused that we can't get access. I mean, even when we have an integrated healthcare system like we do at Kaiser, it's still hard to access the data. So I think there's some commons where we need to be doing that. It's very similar in many ways to what was described about the, the, the fragmentation of the research enterprise and, the, and, and how do you collect samples in a large enough pool that you actually have sufficient data that you can work with. We need the same thing. And letting many of these things fragment is not the right way to go. And I think to have these pooled uh, capabilities requires a kind of commons that is by definition a not-for-profit. The other thing is, um, I, I think that these delivery solutions, some of them really, to get, to get through the early hoops, uh, have to be, I think, funded with venture money, and, and uh, there's no other source. And probably to do the roll-ups, you probably need private equity capabilities, because again, there's not capital, and most of, the, most of the healthcare systems don't have this kind of investment capital available. Real question is what happens over the long run, whether or not you continue to maintain that delivery capability in primary care that I mentioned here uh, as a private sector delivery capability or a privately organized for-profit delivery capability or something different. And I think the, the jury's out on that, Ed. I think it's been uh, brought up a number of times, the, the fact that we're spending far more than we need to uh, c in comparison to anything, including the rest of the developed world on healthcare. That's pretty obvious. Now, the, the, um, 
the question is, when we start reducing these, 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 uh, uh, the costs that we have, someone's going to have to suck it up. Yep. And that's been the problem. With Obama, yep. he came in with some good intent, and I think he may have come out with the best he could have. A lot of people complain about the health care bill, but I think it is a step in some direction. Certainly, we, the cost control part has not been handled. So I guess the question is, how do we get to that? As we're doing all this stuff, all these ideas are great that everyone's talked about to reduce costs. I agree with all of them, including d some of the techno directions as well as the more lifestyle directions. There's a lot of different ways you can reduce costs. They all work, and there's a lot of different angles. But each time we do one of those, someone ain't going to get paid somewhere for an right. extra service they're getting now, and it's going to mean someone's going to have to suck it up. And each time that happens, a lobbying group's going to show up. So what do we do about that? Well, that's why I was glad that the government didn't put their hands on these kinds of disruptive innovations, because that's exactly what would have been happening had the government, and, I, and listen, I believe in a strong government. I'm a Democrat, you know? Come on. I support what Obama did. It was what I think he was able to get in a, in a hung jury, basically. So I don't have any problems with what he did. I was just desperately hoping that neither he nor Congress would put their hands on these innovations because what they end up doing is worrying more about whose ox is getting gored than about the value of the disruption. I don't believe you can, you can uh, national public policy or state public policy your way to this. And part of the reason is that slide I showed you before which is the current state of the sick care system that so dominates the rest of primary care, end of life care, and public health. It consumes all of those resources. I can't get health care systems to think about a consumer-based primary care delivery system. Can't get them to do it. How am I going to do it is exactly what happened with the Minute Clinic. They didn't go to the health care systems. The CEO was the former CEO of of uh, Burger King, as I recall. He saw the consumer Sorry, there I am. A con it was a consumer play. It was directed to people who are not getting their needs met by the sick care system. This really goes to Clay Christensen's point. You don't get the sick care system to change or the established status quo to change unless, until you disrupt things for them in a significant way. And they will fight and struggle and try and use every tool at their, at their command to stop it from happening. That's exactly what happened with the Minute Clinics. Every state medical society in the 15 states that Minute Clinics started in, every state medical society went to the state Supreme Court to try and enjoin the Minute Clinics from opening. They lost in every state, but it is entirely predictable that they would use every tool. That's what's happened in every industry when there's a disruptive innovation or disruptive uh, kind of new approach to doing things that comes along. So there is no way to avoid the fact that there will be a redistribution of the resources and the income and the benefits that come to healthcare. And I don't care. And I, I say that not, not cavalierly. Because we see how we're doing now. It's not that individuals in that system are bad. I don't mean that. I understand we're all, you know, the system is acting exactly as we set up the incentives for it to do. We're not going to get it to change until it has to, until a hospital system is facing a 50% decrease in its demand in its volume, or a primary care physician or a group of primary care physicians says, hey, if I don't change how I deliver care and get out of this notion that every patient has to come see me and congratulate myself that I've got a panel of 2,000 patients that I take care of, wow, I added a, com a computer and now I can take care of 2,500 and now I've got phone and email so I can get to 3,000. Isn't that superb? Good use of technology. Why aren't you taking care of 20,000 people with one physician using all of these other tools? That's when you get the kind of disruption. And it's, it's, it's harsh, but you can't 
do it in a planful way. You can't do it in a policy way because the way we're set up, we can't do it like China. Okay. Thank you, David. That's a wonderful talk. I was worried for a long time until we got to this very end when you talk about the commons because there is an enormous issue here around incentives. Why are companies going out and doing these things? Who's paying for them? Are they getting information about them or are they delivering a service to me for me or for somebody else? Do um, you want an answer? No, not just yet. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to the second. But I do want it because it is, it's an incredibly important issue in this space, because you know, many of the companies, yeah, that, the no, brand names you mentioned, I know them in detail and understand what they're doing and why, and it's not always for the interest of the patient. Okay. Uh, in terms of the one thing that you did raise, which is really critical, this is really about re redefining, I, I hate the term, but I'll use it for a moment, what a hospital is, in a sense. And it's redefining the, the community as the hospital. That is the bricks and mortar, the physician practice, uh, the daycare center even are simply nodes on a network. Mm. What binds it together is no longer the bricks and mortar. It is the information system in a particular form, and it's not the 100,000-foot view that's important, it's the 25-foot view that's important, and that's where we make the mistake. But it's the information system as a collaborative, transparent, accountable system that makes it work. And I've been doing a lot of work, what, the stuff, the term they use is healthcare unbound. This yeah. is all your wireless devices. Yeah. So I've been working in that area for the last five or six years. And it's all wonderful. But in my work in the UK where we were working on this in, in the southeast, the conclusion that I reached at least within the NHS context was that fundamental piece, the bricks and mortar, has to be in the UK context, we call it a social enterprise. It has to stand above and apart from the vested interests and ultimately on behalf of the patient. Otherwise, it really won't work. And the trick is, and particularly in this environment, I understand how to do it in the NHS, although there's a hell of a lot of politics around that, bureaucracy. What I don't really understand is how that would happen here. Well, that, I'm going I'm, I'm to intervene on two counts. The first of all, who's paying for the creation of this primary care system? It actually is going to be in two or three ways. Right now, there's, there are three or four, to begin, there's three or four current revenue sources that are being tapped. The employer obviously is paying for some of it. A great deal of it is coming directly out of pocket for consumers. Um, some of it is coming through cross subsidies, depending on who the technology company is that's supporting this or who the, who the bundler is that's putting it together. There may be some peripheral opportunities. That's why Walgreens is doing it, why Walmart is doing it. Basically subsidizing the creation of Minute Clinic or, 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 or those sorts of things because it increases foot traffic into their drug source, right? They're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing it because it improves their businesses. Good, I, I can take advantage of that. So that's right now. But I'm also, I just, as a matter of fact, before I flew out here, I just had a note from a friend who said, would you look at this company for me? They are putting together a system of primary care capabilities and they will go at risk, capitate, for all of primary care and all of sick care. Not an individual doc, not three or four or five, which failed, but a collective that is a primary care delivery capability. So what they're gonna go to are the self-insured ins uh, uh, employers and say, you put us at risk and here's what the net reduction is likely to be in your total healthcare cost. Another way of thinking about it is to actually set up a separate way of insuring what goes on in primary care, and that's a different set of things that gets insured than sick care. Another way of financing it. So we're still looking for those models. What we do know is that you can't get there if all you have are a series of isolated one-off solutions. You know, I can, I can do really well with the diabetic at home, I can do really well with this, I can do really well with that. You gotta bundle them, you gotta integrate those. Now, that can become an integrated whole. I am very skeptical in the short run that you can actually do it and integrate it in an integrated way with the sick care system for the reasons that Christensen and Grossman and Wang talked about at some level. And that is, it's awfully hard for a sick care system that whose, whose participants are so dominant to let go enough for the kinds of things to develop that are developing in that primary care capability. We found in Colorado the, um, the foundation community has really 
uh, been spiriting the medical home for a while now. I think you probably have heard about some of the programs. Yeah. And, we, and we've also found this to be very successful in the graduate medical education yeah. programs where you, said you, you tend to have a captive audience. Yep. Uh, no need for a comment on that. I just, I, what, what struck me about your, um, and I'm glad you left it up, it, it seems somewhat linear and static when you look at the primary care role within the whole system. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be more appropriate to see sort of the, um, that be the center? And, and it's much more dynamic, isn't it? Where you have public health constantly intervening in the process and, and, it, and as the sick care comes in and out of, out of the process as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to scare everybody any more than this does. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if, I, if it were me designing the universe, I'd put that green circle at the center of the whole damn thing and then have these other relationships going, you know, feeding the sick care system, actually mediating the whole issue of end of life care. And also the public health capabilities for communities. So yes, I do it differently. It is much more dynamic. And I honestly, I'm just learning a new way to do PowerPoint. So uh, <laughs> the, the, I, and when I was redoing my slides last night and this morning after hearing these wonderful discussions, I, I couldn't figure out how to do the animation the way I wanted to. So, yeah, my next presentation, I'll figure out how to do it. <laughs> Thank you very much.